Amen. Long as I can with all that I am. Well, you've got all eternity, so get ready. <laughs> Amen. It should start now, though. Been in our series of messages having to do with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought the fiery judgment was getting ready to fall this morning. Kind of smells like it in here, doesn't it? Had a little air conditioner fire going on, this heater fire this morning. So I sent Tim in the back to make sure it was put out. He said, well, Julie, I turned the breaker off. I said, well, go make sure the fire's out, too. So, wouldn't hurt, right? So if you hear a fire alarm go off, we'll all exit quietly together, okay? But there is a fire alarm that ought to be sounding about the day and the age in which we're living, and it is the day of the Lord's return. Uh, I, I am excited about these series of messages. Last week, we got into an overview and why we preach and why we believe and why we study. In fact, we're going to do some study this morning, all right? So this is not for the faint of heart or for the faint of mind. I want you to pay attention. I think it's important that we do, as I preached about last week, get a grip on where we are and what's going on and understand the times and the seasons. And I think because we have this capacity of having the whole of God's Word before us and the ability to read and study, we can piece the pieces together of the, of the prophecy puzzle to see where we are and what's coming and how, how things are laid out in the days that are ahead of us. In fact, I'm going to challenge your thinking today and give you about four or five views concerning the end times and popular views that are out there. And we'll weigh in on each one of them a little bit and close, obviously, with the one I think is right. And you'll, you'll have to see for yourself. You know, there's a lot of things that are what I call non-negotiables in regard to the Bible. There's no argument. Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. He is the born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life, was a perfect sacrifice for our sins because he knew no sin. He was crucified, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, he's come again. Those are non-negotiables. In fact, if you've ever been to our 101 class to become a member of our church, you have to believe those non-negotiables to even be a member of Believer's Fellowship. You don't believe those, then you're not, you know, you're not ready to join Believer's Fellowship. There's just certain things that you embrace if you're going to be a part of our church that have to do with with the essence, the integrity, and the authority of Scripture. Now, when it comes to certain theology and Scriptures, there are some things that what I would say fall under the, the, the line of uh, negotiables, all right? In other words, we do believe that Jesus is coming, and we do believe in a glorious appearing. We do believe in a taking away of the saints. Now, we can differ on those views as to how that all fits together and when that takes place in the end times, but, you know, we all believe the dead in Christ shall rise. The Scripture teaches us that. But when will that take place? Will that take place at the first of the tribulation? We know there's a tribulation the Bible talks about. Will it take place in the middle of tribulation? That's kind of a non-negotiable. We can disagree on some of those things and not be mad and not separate fellowship and have a great time together and love each other and just debate those kind of things because they fall under the line of non-negotiables. You can be wrong in some of these areas, all right, and still love Jesus, all right? It doesn't mean you're a heretic to be off in some of those areas. But there's not one specific singular verse in scripture that says Christ will come before the tribulation. Not one. Not one that says he'll come in the middle of the tribulation. There's not one that says he'll come at the end of the tribulation. All right. There's no specific verse that states that. But what we do have the capacity to do is to take all these passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament and lay them on the table and put them together like this puzzle and say, what goes where? And I think become very reasonably and very, very, very close to what, to what goes where. So that's, that's what we want to do when it comes to understanding as we talked about last week, the, the events and laid out the chart. And we'll, we'll look at some of those charts again this morning. But one thing we do believe is that Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to come in power and glory and the dead in Christ will be raised and those who are alive shall meet him in the air. Amen. So I want to look, share just a couple of scriptures and we're going to get into what I would call today some rapture theology and talk about it and think about it and get a, get a grip on where we are in the end times. It says, but I would, have you, uh, I would have, not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. It's talking about people who've died and knew Jesus. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, he's going to bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, 
am the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So that's what we believe. The Bible describes as this taking away, even though the word rapture, it's, a, it's really a, from the base of a Latin word, means to catch up. The concept of the catching away and the taking away and the taking up, which we call the rapture, is in the scripture. In fact, it's referred to in Titus as the blessed hope. The Bible says in Titus, looking for that blessed hope. And also we're looking for something else. The glorious appearing of, the, of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe for the most part of the church, that that taking away, that rapture, that, that, that time when Jesus comes for the saints will be prior to the tribulation because the tribulation is just that. It's tribulation. It's wrath of God being poured up upon the earth. Doesn't mean we're, that, we're not without trouble. 60% of the world's Christians today are suffering persecution. They're having tremendous turmoil, a heartache and pain, loss and suffering. But it does mean, I believe very clearly, that we won't go through the time of tribulation that the Bible talks about, those seven years upon the earth when things are just torrentially miserable and hard. So the big question upon many Christians' mind is, is, is which, when is that going to take place in the context of the end times? Now, there's about five or six views I want to look at today. The first one, let me discard quickly, which I will call uh, of these, and you'll see on, on the list of the events, will, will be this amillennialist view. And we'll talk about that. And following that, we'll talk about the mid-tribulation rapture the post-tribulation rapture, the pre-wrath rapture, the partial rapture, and the pre-tribulation rapture. And we'll make up something else as we go along maybe. Even so. Because these are, even though well, that's a strange list, these are the most popular concepts that are out there today of what people believe in regard to the return of Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church where Jesus comes and takes the church away to himself. Now there was a popular theology of all this was the amillennialist popular, popular in a lot of seminaries in the 70s. And uh, even so, in a lot of groups today, in a lot of religious circles, this amillennial view is very popular. Basically, amillennial means without a millennium. They deny the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, that thousand-year kingdom. It, it's good for people who like to interpret the Bible by spiritualizing all the literal and then making them spiritual. In other words, they basically say, I know what the Bible says, but that's not what it means. That's allegorical. That's spiritual. It doesn't mean what it really says. The Bible tells us very clearly that it means what it says, by the way, okay? And there's some things that when they are kind of metaphorical and symbolic, it's very clear that that's what they are. Uh, the view of the amillennialist really gets down to this, you know, it teaches the church is Israel, you know, and that uh, it's kind of an anti-Israeli view. They believe, you know, that uh, uh, Israel's lost its God. The church has taken the place of Israel and all the promises of Israel are given to the church. There's no thousand year kingdom because a, a thousand years doesn't really mean a thousand years. And, and instead it means something spiritual. In fact, it's, it's something so spiritual that only the amillennials can understand it. So if you're not one, then you, you really can't get it. It really is a foolish belief. And try to get the person to take a, a literal portions of the Bible and trying to spiritualize them away into some kind of secret meaning that only they understand. I have very little respect for this particular view because, you know, uh, I believe that it robs the, the, the nation of Israel of those literal translations of scripture, those interpretations of prophecy that have everything in the world to do with Israel and not with the church. The problems, as we say, they deny, you know, the imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, because there, you got you know, there's no thousand year reign. There's nothing to be looking forward to. There's, there's no surprise or unknown time when the rapture is going to occur. And last but not least in this is the followers of these people are particularly hard to talk to about their beliefs because they've blinded themselves to the simplicity of Scripture and just how plain the Bible is by spiritualizing all, anything to do with prophecy into some kind of, 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 uh, of uh, symbolic kind of thing. So that's the, the view that pretty much just pushed right off the table because it just doesn't hold, hold to the Bible. All right? so, but again, it's still popular because people... I think if I'm living in kind of a liberal mindset, I don't want to believe that Jesus is coming anytime soon. And then there's the, the view we'll call the mid-tribulation rapture view. And I showed you kind of this chart last week where we talked, talked about the, the church age and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're in this particular season and time. Following this will be the time of tribulation, seven years in the middle of the tribulation. The Antichrist will come and then the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. At the end of that, we have the great white throne of judgment you know, judgment upon nations. And so all that takes place right in there. But the mid-tribulation view, let me go back up to uh, 
to this. The mid-tribulation view kind of holds to this fact that the, that the, the rapture is going to take place sometime in the, the middle of the tribulation, all right? Sometime around the abomination of what the Bible calls in 2 Thessalonians, when the Antichrist comes to power, it's the, the abomination of desolation. You know, he comes in, and that's when the Antichrist uh, agrees for the rebuilding of the temple and all these things, and he goes into the temple and claims to be God. Now, there are some problems with this particular view when you kind of hold it up to the, to the rest of the prophetic puzzle. Problem number one is it, pretty simple. That It says that uh, they deny the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we're, it's, it's not what we're looking for. We're looking for something to happen before Jesus comes. We're back. There's, there's no surprise at all because if you believe this, you, you believe the Antichrist has to come first. And so following that or right about the time you see Antichrist, then the Christ will appear on the scene, you know, and come and, as the Antichrist comes to confirm uh, his, that he's God and confirm this covenant, then the rapture takes place. This is not the most popular view of all the views. It's somewhat rare. But these people are looking for and waiting for Antichrist rather than looking for the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes away any excitement, any, any uh, expectation of what we call the blessed hope of Jesus coming. Because I'm not looking for Jesus. I'm looking for the Antichrist. And anytime I'm looking for the Antichrist, I usually end up in trouble. Amen? So that's the mid-tribulation rapture. The second view, well, the third view we'll talk about is the post-tribulation rapture. And this is the idea where you have the rapture here. I mean, you have the church here and tribulation comes. And what will happen is that the rapture will come right at the end of the tribulation period. And Jesus comes and his glorious appearing kind of all synonymous together. This all happens. So basically the church goes through the tribulation and the Lord returns, you know, as we're taking up. The battle of Armageddon's taking place and he, he reveals himself at that point. Uh, it's kind of interesting because we're caught up and then we return. I mean, why go up if we're going to just come right back? I mean, it's like Jesus has to leave heaven with about, I don't know how many thousands of horses because we're going to come back with the Lord on horseback, right? And so he has to bring us our horses and we get them to get our assignments, I don't know, in the air, the cloud. It, you know, there's just some puzzle pieces that seem to be mentioned. And the rapture's kind of clumped in with everything else at this point. The judgment seat, the marriage of the Lamb, the appearing of Christ, you know, the Antichrist being overthrown, the battle of Armageddon, false prophets being thrown to hell. All that kind of just thrown into the, to the same pot. Post-tribulation, meaning after the tribulation. Problem is, this particular view denies, again, the imminent return of Christ Jesus. There's no surprise or unknown time when the Lord comes, you know. It just, it just happens. There's no surprise or uh, unexpected event. These people are, again, looking, waiting for, for Antichrist instead of the Christ. They're uh, not looking for, with expectation to Jesus coming. Everybody's looking to the tribulation. Everybody's looking at the, the judgments on the tribulation, thinking that, hey, that once we get through all this stuff and get to the battle of Armageddon, again, then we know Jesus is coming. That certainly takes away the concept of a blessed hope, amen? What makes the blessed hope so blessed is Jesus, number one, but two, we're out of here. We're not gonna go through the wrath of God. We're not gonna go through the tribulation. And again, I, I think this view is quite foolish because when you think it through at the battle of Armageddon, Jesus, you know, returns with him all, his people riding on horses, and we're just now getting up to, to, the, to the whole idea. The Bible tells us very clearly that as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, you know, that during that time, people are buying, selling, marrying, planting, harvesting. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man's return. In other words, business as usual. Then all of a sudden, there's a flood. There were warnings. There were God's people. There was a presence of God, but people rejected it. And then judgment came, and as in the days of Lot, and as in the days of Noah, God delivered them from the wrath that came upon the earth, or upon Sodom, and took his people out. That's a good picture of, of the church and of the rapture in the Old Testament, how that we will be delivered from judgment. But this particular view takes us all the way through judgment. It takes us through, as Christians, through, you know, seven years of hell on earth. It's going to be a miserable time. It's not going to be, you know, business as usual. Life is not going to be normal. There's not going to be buying and selling and marrying and planting. You know, it's going to be impossible to live. All the grass is burned up. The trees are burned up. The water's poisoned. Things are turned to blood. It's a miserable, chaotic world in which we live in. That's not like the days of not a lot, and it's not at all like the, the days of, of Noah in description. All this happens uh, with no one expects. Hey, you're going to expect all these judgments to come, all these problems to come, all, these, all this chaos to come. 
But the thing about it is believers, I do not believe that we as believers, according to the book of Revelation, will go through the wrath that is getting ready to be poured out upon the planet. It has this terrible problem when you look at this whole idea about going at the end of the tribulation. It has this terrible problem of, of leaving no one left on the earth to populate it during the thousand year reign. You say, what do you mean? Right now, there's close to seven billion people on the planet. When you start following these judgments, through, and I'm going to walk you through them very briefly here in just a moment. When you, when you go through these judgments and you see how many people are going to die, you know, there probably won't be a hundred million people left on the planet to start with after the tribulation and, of, and the great tribulation. We're going to go from seven to eight billion people to a few hundred million people because of all, the, and there's one judgment under one seal. I mean, you have one fourth of the earth destroyed, a third of the population destroyed after that. It's, it's, it's plagues and diseases and famine and pestilence like the world's never seen. The church is not going through it. And I think it takes away this particular view, the expectation of the blessed hope. Another popular view is this one we call the pre-wrath rapture view. It's a, this is the view of the rapture that understands that God will pour out his wrath upon his people. Again, you know, but it, they'll have to go through tribulation, but not through the great tribulation. When you break down prophecy, the seven-year tribulation is really broken down into two parts very clearly. There's three and a half years of tribulation, which is the wrath of God. And then there's another three and a half years of great tribulation called the time of Jacob's trouble. God's uniquely dealing with Israel in all this process and bringing them back to the, to the place of the God of their fathers. The pre-wrath rapture teaches that the Antichrist is going to rise to power. He'll confirm his seven-year covenant with Israel. And sometime right after the middle of the seventh year period, and sometime before the end of the seventh year period, the seventh seal is open. And that, they teach that seventh seal is really just, that's God's wrath upon the earth. And they believe that the church is going to be present for the first six seal judgments, but be raptured before the seventh terrible judgment falls to earth. The problems here are multiple. One is, again, it denies the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing you find about prophecy in the New Testament from Jesus to the apostles was a constant word saying, be ready at any hour. When you least expect it, it's going to happen. All right. It always is an hour of, uh, uh, when it's, it's unexpected. First, the Antichrist, according to their view, you know, we're not looking for the return of Christ. The Antichrist has to come to power. He confirms his covenant with Israel for seven years. And then they say the rapture comes sometime after that. So there's no surprise rapture. There's, there's, there's no unexpected time of the Lord's return to earth. We just kind of know when it's going to come. Uh, you know, that, that hopefully that as we can endure these, this miserable time of, of these years, but the rapture occurs sometime after the middle of, of the tribulation, and after the seventh seal open, and then we'll be all right. Now, here's the problem. If this particular, if we call it pre-wrath, before the, the worst of the wrath of God, basically they will put it. If it's pre-wrath, and they have to kind of add pre-wrath because the Bible says in Revelation we won't go through the, we won't experience the wrath of God, but they don't realize that the tribulation is the wrath of God. All the tribulation. People say, we're not going to go through the great tribulation. If you're here for the first day of the tribulation, you're going to think it's the great tribulation. <laughs> and let me explain to you, because the way it breaks out in the book of, of, of Revelation, and Tim taught this on Wednesday nights, but let me give you a, a quick overview. Let me get past this slide here. A quick overview of how these judgments break out. And first of all, there's the seal judgment, and then the Bible says following that are the trumpet judgments, and following that are the vile or the bowl judgment. All right, this, this is the way it starts in the beginning of the tribulation. You know, you see with, with, with the four horsemen, the first seal is broken and the white horse, the Antichrist is, is released and he rises to power. The second seal, following this, wars begin to break out all over the earth, more than the world has ever seen. The third seal is worldwide economic trouble. Because of all the world, obviously, kind of like a domino's falling, Antichrist invokes all these problems. You see all the economic crisis flow, introduction of the mark of the beast, all those things follow right in here. Within the fourth seal, and by the fourth seal now, we have death being released. One fourth of the world's population is going to die under the fourth seal. I'm just Sticking it, there we go. One fourth of the world's population is going to die by plagues, by disease, by the beasts of the earth. You can follow it and other things that will kill. One fourth, all right? Billions of people will die. This is the wrath of God. In the, under the fifth seal, the, there's persecution and the killing of God's people. These are people who get saved during the tribulation. They refuse to take the mark of the beast. These are people who, who believe the word of God and believe the prophets finally. And now, these are not people who sat in church every Sunday and understood the gospel but never got saved. The Bible talks about, and we'll discuss that at some other time, about how God will send a strong delusion so that they'll believe a lie. 
In other words, they had their opportunity during this age of grace. They sat in church, they heard the message, and they continually rejected the truth of God's word. This, the Bible says for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. In other words, they'll be deluded by all the things that Antichrist and all the judgment of the end times. And then under the sixth seal, there's massive earthquakes. Under the seventh seal, there's silence, and then breaks forth judgment, continued judgment. The trumpet judgments happen at this point. The first trumpet judgment is hell and fire and blood. And one third of all the grass and all the trees is burned up and destroyed. The second trumpet, great mountains begin to fall into the sea. One third of all ocean becomes, becomes blood. One third of all sea life dies. One third of all the ships on the oceans are destroyed. Under the third trumpet, Wormwood star, great star hits the earth and one third of all the fresh water on the planet is poisoned. Under the fourth trumpet, one third of the sun and the moon is darkened. Can you imagine the ecological turmoil and upheaval that's taking place in nature itself as it just goes into convulsions at this place? Under the fifth trumpet, locusts, Locusts, uh, beasts that sting and torment men are loosed from the pit, according to scripture. Under the sixth trumpet, demons are released and 200 million Eastern army kills one third of the world's population. That's a big army, first of all. There's only one country in the world that could boast of an army like that. An army in the East, as the Bible calls it, which would today be modern day China. But they begin their march and under the seventh trumpet, cries from heaven and the seven bold judgments are now to be released upon the earth. So are you with me so far? This is not a picnic, is it? This is, this is the wrath of God. Under the bold judgment, it doesn't get any better, all right? Under the bold judgment, there's terrible first bowl, painful sores break on in, out on anybody, which is most of the people who are worshiping the beast and the antichrist. Under the second bowl, entire ocean becomes blood. All sea life is now dead. Under the third bowl, Fresh water becomes blood. There's no more drinking water. There's no more functional water. There's no more fresh water. Under the fourth judgment, under this fourth bowl, the sun begins to increase in its heat and scorches and literally burns people. Under the fifth bowl, supernatural darkness now takes place over all the earth. Under the sixth bowl, this great eastern army is now heading towards Armageddon in the Middle East for the final battle. Under the seventh bowl, Babylon is destroyed, massive earthquakes, 100 pound hailstorms devastate the earth. I mean, it's just judgment and judgment and judgment. So I hate to burst the bubble of the pre-wrath rapture folks who talk about the seventh seal, all right? But the, but the first trumpet and the first bowl judgment, the first seal, they're all God's wrath. They're just greater degrees, but they're all God's wrath. I mean, look at the fourth seal judgment. One fourth of all the world's population is dying. That's the judgment. That's the wrath of God. Eight billion people on the planet. The fourth seal judgment alone will kill 1.5 billion people. That's the wrath of God. But the pre-wrath folks, they're kind of have you to believe that the wrath does not really begin until the bold judgments begin. I encourage them to look a little more carefully at the book of Revelation to see what these judgments are doing. So that's not one that's going to pass the biblical muster, so to say, for my book, and I'll slide it off the table. Another is the, the partial rapture view. I've got relatives that believe this, all right? I got friends that believe this, and this is a very, this, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a relatively new theory. Hal Lindsey titled this as the New Protestant Purgatory. It suggests that the best Christians, you know, are going to be raptured, you know, right before the tribulation at the beginning. All right? And then those of you who have not been good little boys and girls, good Christians, you're going to have to wait out part of the tribulation. You're going to have to go through part of the wrath of God to teach you a lesson. That's what I said. <laughs> Now get this from Hebrews 9, 28, you know, and I will look at this just a moment, but the idea here is that somewhere, you know, in the process of this, this chart that here comes the rapture, and a little while later, after you've suffered enough to bring you to a place of genuine repentance in your life, you know, like you've been a, you've kind of been a, you've been a believer, but you hadn't been committed. You've been a believer, but you, you hadn't, you hadn't been following Christ. You're backslidden or your heart's cold and you're going to have to go through part of this judgment just to kind of teach you a lesson to bring you to a place of repentance. And then the Lord will show up with a little second time for you alone. 
All right, and this is this is all happening here in this this early part of, of the tribulation period. So it is a strange particular view, and it does have some problems. But it basically suggests that if you're a good Christian, then you know you'll get to go first. And, and the people who believe this, by the way, I've never met one who believed this. It was said they were part of the second group. They always believe they're part of the first group. Interestingly enough, all right. But they take this from Hebrews 9, 28, where the Bible says, to those who eagerly wait for him, for he will appear a second time apart for sin for salvation. And somehow they, con they concoct out of that a whole new rapture view that this is dealing with the rapture. And, and, and it's not, all right. It's an inherent belief that, that somehow that uh, if you're not living a really biblical, consecrated Christian life, you know, then you don't get to go. But hey, don't worry too much. You're not gonna have to go through all the tribulation you know, he'll come back and get you for it for the worst of the worst begins to happen. A lot of problems with this. They believe that Christians not living this consecrated life be left behind, you know, maybe another chance at, at, at the tribulation. But the problem is, this is all based upon good works, not grace. And I believe the Bible and, and, and our relationship to Jesus Christ is based upon grace, not upon good works. That when Jesus died for my sins and I by faith accepted the faith, put my life in Jesus' hands, I believe with all my heart that he paid the price for my sin. Amen. Let me give you something here. He paid the price for all my sin. Amen. He paid the price for my sin yesterday and today and forever. That if I fell or stumble in some way today, that my sins have already been paid for. I just have to, to enjoy it and to enjoy my freedom and, my tr and, and walk in truth and grace. I have to agree with God to get rid of that sin in my life. Turn from it. Confess my sins, all right, and agree with God over my sins. And I can be forgiven and experience forgiveness. But it's all been paid for. Judgment has already occurred. There's no amount of tribulation judgment that's going to work in my Christian life to, to do or to even come equal to do what Jesus already did on the cross. He paid for all my sin. Doesn't mean I want to go out and live like the devil, does it? No, it means I'm so in love with Jesus and I appreciate so much what he's done for me. I want to live for him. I want to honor him in my life. The Bible says that the grace of God teaches us that we deny ungodliness. All right. So the more I understand grace, the more I hate sin. The less I understand grace, the less I, the, probably the more, I, more I'll be involved in my sin. But hey, there doesn't have to be this time of kind of corporal punishment for me because Jesus Christ has taken everything upon himself for me all right. All right. And again, invariably, those people who kind of hold this view, they're always the ones who are going to go in the first rapture. They're never going to volunteer for the second rapture. And we've had people in our own fellowship who, who kind of embrace this doctrine. We love each other. We can argue about it. We can debate each other. But hey, let's get down to what I believe is the most biblically correct view of all the scripture. And it is this pre-tribulation pre rapture view. That at the beginning of tribulation, I believe it's the rapture that sets the tribulation off. That sends the world spinning into chaos. That makes the people more acceptable of an antichrist than they've ever been before. And we know already that the world is staged for this. All right. We've seen things happening around us that the world has staged for this for many, many years now. The world's been ready for something, for one leader to step on the scene. And somehow this one leader is going to bring international grace and peace and blessing for the world. But that international leader is going to be Jesus and no one else. And there'll be one who pretends to be him, and he is the Antichrist, and he will make his appearance during this time of tribulation. The pre-tribulation view, I believe, is the only one that is consistent, or at least is the very most consistent, with the Word of God. It allows, first and foremost, for a rapture that can come at any time, which is what we believe. It's an unexpected event. In fact, the, the rapture could come today. There's no other prophecies that need to be fulfilled for the rapture to come. It's, we, could, we are in these days of what you might even call the rapture days. It teaches that the, the rapture, you know, it's, click my button here. It teaches that after the rapture, the restrainer of evil will be removed, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit through the church. So I, I believe with all my heart that when Jesus comes and, and the church is gone, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit it's not going to be what it was before. And we know that God's omnipresent. People are going to be saved in the tribulation. All right. People say, well, how can people be saved without the Holy Spirit? Now, it just says the restrainer that's restraining all the evil, his ministry of restraining is going to be taken away. And what happens, that that's that point where people believe anything and embrace anything and not only believe it, they radically follow it. So at this point, the Antichrist can rise to power. He can do his thing, confirm his, his, covenant, his covenants and agreements. At the, at the point the Antichrist rises to power, he confirms his treaty with Israel, and the whole world seems to accept his doctrines and his theology and his mindset, even to the point of the mark of the beast. 
the end of the seven-year period where we see that great battle, the battle of Armageddon, the Lord Jesus returns with the church behind him and destroys the Antichrist with the brilliance and with the word of his mouth, he destroys the enemy. That's that pre-tribulation rapture view. God's people survive the seven-year period on earth. They enter into that thousand-year kingdom. Many of them won't survive it for to believe in Jesus during the tribulation period. The Bible says they'll, they'll pay the cost of their life for it. Those who get saved at the very end of it may be the only few that would survive. But I, see, I believe you see this throughout all of Scripture. I, I think you see it clearly in one verse in, in, in Titus chapter 2, two about the, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. We're looking for those days. They're about seven years apart, I believe, in Scripture. But not only do you see it in one verse like in Titus, you can see it all in one chapter. If you go through this particular chapter in, in, uh, in Thessalonians, you see the whole thing laid out before you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I've got it on the Scripture. I'm going to break it down in just a moment for you. But he talks about the Lord Jesus come. We're going to be gathered unto him. And as you go through this chapter, he talks about the man of sin. And then later on, the Lord destroys the man of sin. And then the Lord comes in glory through this whole chapter. Let me just show you on the chart the way it breaks down real quick so we don't read the whole thing to you. And in this chart, here's the way it breaks down. First of all, he talks about our gathering together unto him. All right, in verse 1. Then he also talks about the day of the Lord, which is the glorious appearing. He talks about that in a couple of verses. He also talks about the man of sin being revealed and the man of sin desecrating the temple, called the abomination of desolation. And then he talks about the man of sin being destroyed by Christ. All that breaks down in verses 3 and 4 and 8. So you see this whole chapter is given over to just laying the end time scenario out little bit by little bit, verse by verse. Now, if I'd had more time today, I may just bring you a chart, but I have one chart that I've, that I've put together that shows this pre-tribulation rapture view in the book, used not just a verse or just a chapter, but a whole book. We take the Reve book of Revelation and break it down by chapter and verse into this chart and show you where each one of these events in the chronological order that is laid out in the book of Revelation. You see it all clearly laid out. So what am I saying? I believe, first of all, like many of you do, the rapture is going to take place. But I also believe that it will take place prior to the tribulation or in about the same events of, of the tribulation forming in the world around us. I believe that the Lord will deliver us from the tribulation of the end times and the seven years, especially through all of it, not just part of it. Now, if that is all true and we say we believe that, then let me share one last important scripture, maybe two with you. In Romans 13, if we know the time, he says, and knowing the time that now it is high time to wake up out of our sleep, for, our, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believe. What time is it? Do we know the time? Do we realize what time we're in? Do we realize that the next big event on God's calendar is the return of for the church, for saved people to be caught up into himself and for the tribulation judgment times to begin upon the earth. I love this when it talks about knowing the time or knowing the season. It's the word kairos in the Greek language that is the word for time and it can be translated season. The scripture says, but at the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. In other words, we don't know the exact day hour, nor what month, nor what day of the month, nor what time of that day he may have come, but we know we're in this season. How many of you know today when you woke up and stepped out that it was winter? And why did you know it was winter? Wait till Thursday morning when you step out and it's about 28 or 29 with a real feel of about 22. You say, hey, it's winter. Doesn't happen often in Houston, but it gets here for a few weeks out of the year. It's wintertime. How do you know that? Because you know how the seasons work and you know how th that works. He says you ought to know what season you're in spiritually. You ought to be able to judge by the things that are happening in the world around you of what time and what season is. And since you do know what time it is, then you need to realize it's also time to get up. It's time to wake up. I love the way he writes it. In fact, he kind of lays it out here. You know, he says, first of all, he says, it's time to wake up. And wake up is this word that has to do with the idea of collecting your senses, slapping yourself, washing your face with water, whatever it takes to get your senses roused. Wake up out of sleep. I, I love Wefter's dictionary definition because it certainly could be that de definition for modern church. All right. This could be what, what it says beside it for, for modern church. A condition of the body or mind where there's little or no conscious thought. 
Little or no voluntary movement with intermittent dreaming. Isn't that where so many in church are today? Isn't that where the Western Hemisphere church is today? Little or no conscious thought about the Lord, about God, about what's going on in the world around them. Little or no conscious thought about the Bible, about lost souls, about the end of times, about the judgments of God. Little intermittent dreaming, it'll be nice for Jesus to come today. And it's not nice for Jesus to come today. Why is it good for Jesus? Well, I, you know, I gotta pay my bills on the first. If he came today, we wouldn't have to do that. Leave my payments with the Antichrist. Whatever it might be. He says, oh, it's time to arouse yourself, wake yourself up, come to your senses, see what's going on. And he gives three reasons to wake up, and it's very quickly for three things. He says, first of all, the reason to wake up, your salvation is near than when you first believed. You say, well, Brother Joe, I thought I had my salvation. You do have your salvation. But you've heard me say it before. It's kind of like there's three phases, three tenses maybe uh, would be best to say, to salvation. I was saved in 1973, therefore I am saved, all right? So what I, that's my present condition, I'm a saved man. Hallelujah. Can you imagine what it would be like if I was up here as a lost man? I know some of you have had your questions, but anyway, I am a saved man. I, I love Jesus, I'm born again. But I, I'm not, I haven't got this place where God's taking me to. He's gonna give me this glorified body in which it will never sin again, all right? And receive me unto himself. So that's, that, that's the future tense of my salvation. It's going to happen in the future because it's happened in the past already because in Jesus I'm secure. I'm saved. He sees me over here like this already because he's done this for me already. So I, I am saved, but I am going to be saved. Now in the middle of this, we said three tenses. First, I am saved. Right now, I'm supposed to, supposed to be becoming more like Jesus, maturing in my life, growing in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I am, I am being saved. Let's put it that way. I'm saved. I'm becoming more like Jesus. So I'm being saved and I'm going to be saved. He says, my salvation is near. He's talking about this aspect of my salvation. This deliverance, this glorification is nearer now than when we first believed. Well, that's kind of obvious. I mean, that right now it's 40 years closer for me. Well, cuts back when I first believed, 40 years ago. But there's coming this day when this event is going to take place. Knowing that we need to wake up because our salvation's near. Near than ever before, near than any other time in our life. It could be today. So he says, I want you to arouse yourself. I want you to wake up. I want you to listen. Deliverance from your enemies has come. In fact, that's what the word salvation in scriptures always means. It's, it's deliverance, preservation, preservation, safety. All those things kind of tie into the idea of what salvation is. Deliverance from our enemies, deliverance from sin, deliverance from death, deliverance from the devil. Amen. Jesus comes in glory. We'll be saved. And then he said, the second thing that we need to wake up is because the night's far spent. The night's far spent. Now, again, this is, this is obviously the, the idea of, of something that's metaphorical and, you know, and in and, and, and the context of what the night means for us. The, the night means the time when you, you, you quit work, unless you have a night shift, obviously, but the time when work ceases. Sometimes it's referred to as a time of death, all right? It's, it's sometimes, it's, it's, it, it, many times it's, it, in the scriptures, it's referred to that time where, where, where sin takes place and shameful deeds. In other words, nighttime, in the modern sense, is a time for moral stupidity. All right, just ignorance and darkness. The Bible says men love darkness. They love the night because their deeds are evil. Hey, the sun's going down. It's time to party. It's time to be stupid. It's time to be foolish. It's time to act ignorant. The nighttime, he said, listen, the night's far spent. You know, this word prokopto in the, in the Greek language means it's, you know, it's about at the end. It's like this word of prokopto is used about taking a piece of iron and hammering it out. You keep hammering it out, it gets sharper and flatter, you know, as you go out and you're hammering it out and you're just kind of forging a piece of metal. And the idea is that you're hammering it out to the very end. And now where he says that we're, we're beating the end of that piece of metal and it's, it's about forged, just about done. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. What day? I believe he's talking about the rapture day, the blessed hope day, the taking away. The Greek word for that terminology about being caught up to be with the Lord, so forever being caught up to be with the Lord, is the word like snatching by literal force, just taking us right off the place of the planet. In the instant, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen, bam, before you can bat your eye, you're out of here. So sudden, so quick, within a nanosecond, less than that, gone. 
It's not like this little slow process where you're floating up to be with Jesus. Bam! Two lying in bed, one's gone. One wakes up, where'd he go? Two working in the field. How can they be in the field and in bed? Because some parts of the earth will be daylight, some parts will be nighttime. But he'll come like, like a thief in the night. Doesn't say he'll be a thief, like a thief in the night. The thief sneaks in, takes what you have, you didn't know he was there, and he's gone. That's the way it's going to be. When people least expect it, you don't expect the thief. He comes in, I mean, if you'd expect him, you'd been up waiting for him. He comes the least expected moment and takes us out of here. That's the second coming in its first phase. The genuine full definition of the second coming is when we all come back together. And Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, splits it wide in two. The enemy is destroyed with the brightness of his coming and a sword goes out of his mouth and destroys the Antichrist. He sets up his millennial reign upon the earth as the king of kings and the lord of the lords and all the kings of the earth and all the presidents and all the diplomats will come and bow their knees to Jesus and confess his lordship. What a day. It's coming. You need to be ready, amen? Let's stand. I can't think of a better moment to stand than just to examine our hearts.